The city of Cleveland has stated that food trucks can carry a generator that produces no more than 60 decibels. That's about the same volume of a normal human conversation. This is what the Wrap It Up food trucks generator currently sounds like. This generator is producing 96 decibels, which is the same volume as a car horn. Customers and pedestrians are obviously not happy with this, and the food truck staff is also not happy with loading and unloading a heavy generator. We started by measuring the amp hours using a clamp meter with all of the equipment running, and it showed 7 amps. This also stood to reason as the nameplates and manufacturers tags inside some of the equipment showed things like 2.1 amp hours for the refrigerator and 2.4 amp hours for the freezer. We started building the battery bank with the assumption of 10 amp hours, a full 3 amp hours above what we measured on the truck. We also assumed that the refrigerators and freezers would not be running at full speed at all times. Uh, so the 7200 watt battery bank would have a worst case scenario of six hours of runtime. The assumption being that we would get at least eight hours of runtime with the overage of three amp hours along with the fact that the fridges wouldn't be running all the time. The batteries needed to be contained in a safe and sturdy box so we're using aluminum angle and half inch OSB plywood. This will ensure that employees don't have the ability to touch the batteries for any purpose and we're also going to be sealing the box to make sure that none of the kitchen grease that floats around into the truck uh, will damage the batteries or collect on the battery terminals. Since the box is going to be relatively customer facing we wanted to make it as inconspicuous as possible. We also wanted to add a layer of protection so we went with black plasti dip. After we got the batteries into the box, the next step would be to begin building the cables that are going to connect them. We start by cutting the 2 watt cable using large bolt cutters, and then stripping the protective coating off of the ends of the cable. We had to enlarge the holes on the connectors to make sure that they would fit over the battery terminals, and we used the drill press to do that before we added the connectors to the 2 watt cable. We're wiring a 12 volt parallel battery configuration here, so the positive terminal connects to the positive terminal on the next battery, and the negative terminal connects to the negative terminal on the next battery. The hardware store that we stopped at didn't have a, any more 2 watt cables, so we just bought some heavy duty jumper cables, and we're going to use those to connect the battery bank to the inverter. The swagger that we're using to crimp these connectors onto the jumper cable wire is not designed for this application, but we just pretty much made it work. And of course the connectors had to be bent to fit onto the fuse block that we purchased to ensure a good connection as you can see on the right versus the left. With everything fabricated, it was now time to load the inverter and all the other equipment into the truck, wire it to the circuit breaker and turn it on. Sweet bueno. That's battery power right there. That's more good. No phasing, no lag. That is just clean energy right there. Okay, so the truck's running on battery power right now. However, the run from the battery up and around and down to the inverter over there is apparently too long. Uh, DC doesn't like to travel very well and second of all these jumper cables that we had to pick up are not the best for conducting electricity. Uh, they're not meant for that. They're meant to be more pliable um, so we need to go and pick up the proper cable to make this run because the inverter is shutting off. It thinks that the battery bank is dead. So not a big deal. We just got to, uh, do, we're going to do two things. We're going to move the inverter closer to the battery bank and we're going to uh, get better cable to run from the battery bank to the inverter. 
The temperature difference between day one and day two of our installation was almost 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and that'll come into play shortly when we get everything hooked back up. But for now, let's focus on the stuff that had to happen. We took everything apart and relocated the inverter closer to the battery box. We also picked up some of the 2 watt cable that we should have been using and terminated that and hooked that into the batteries as well. So effectively we had better cables with an inverter that was closer to the battery box. However, disaster struck after an hour of operation in the heat. For an explanation of what went wrong and how we resolved it, please take a look at our next video, part two of this series.